Good afternoon, everyone. I am Sarah Rosenwortel, and I have the great privilege of being the president of the Urban Institute and of getting a chance to thank all of you who are joining us from across the country uh, and to get to welcome you to all to the Urban Institute, albeit virtually, and to this great conversation. So first, let me do a couple of housekeeping notes. This event is being recorded and the recording and all of the relevant links will be discussed, will be posted online after the event at the event page. Live captions are turned on. If you wanna turn them off, you can visit the live transcript icon at the bottom of your screen. All participants are muted, but please, if you have questions or comments, type them into the question box at any time, or you can email them to events at urban.org. We'll be sharing a link to a post-event survey, and we really uh, will encourage you to please share your feedback with us. It's so helpful for us and the panelists to hear what you're thinking about and help us shape what we do in the future. And finally, it's great to join the conversation on social media. Please use the hashtag live at urban and uh, the Twitter handles for some of the speakers and uh, join along. So with logistics behind us, I'm really excited for today's discussion. We're gonna talk about how philanthropic support for direct cash assistance is changing the landscape of philanthropy. During the pandemic, philanthropic entities across the US embraced giving differently, transferring cash, not just to grantees, but to people, to individual consumers as an efficient, effective and immediate means of providing relief to those who are hardest hit by the sudden pandemic and the health emergency. Of course, experiments with cash infusions and guaranteed income began before the pandemic. Most recently, in response to concerns about income inequality, we saw well-known tests like the Stockton Economic Empowerment Demonstration and the Magnolia Mothers Trust, as well as efforts overseas. 2021 ushered in a new wave of cash transfer experiments in cities from Compton to Newark that were largely funded by philanthropy. And more recently, states and cities have begun to explore and mount their own cash pilots using the next round of stimulus funds provided under the American Rescue Plan Act. There's already a large and growing body of research on positive effects of cash infusions and guaranteed income and how they can help um, support household stability, well-being, and even by extension, economic mobility. But in today's discussion, we're going to focus on this uh, question from a different angle. We're not just gonna explore the efficacy of these programs, but also examine more closely the additional goals that philanthropists and public funders have been trying to advance by providing cash assistance. Goals in particular, like advancing inclusion and equity for marginalized populations in the context of a safety net that often excludes or constrains people of color. By building understanding of the goals of funders and the emerging public-private partnerships centered on cash infusion and guaranteed income, our goal here at Urban, as always, is to accelerate to solutions, to drive innovative and equitable practice and policy forward. So first today, my Urban colleagues will share the results of some research we've done about these different programs. And following that, a terrific panel will discuss the implications and future of philanthropic efforts aimed at transferring cash directly to individuals. I wanna thank the Greater Washington Community Foundation for their collaboration in this work. Their very dynamic and creative CEO, Tanya Wellings, has been driving much innovation in the DC philanthropic sector. Since the onset of the pandemic and in partnership with lots of donors, nonprofits, and local government agencies, the Greater Washington Community Foundation has facilitated the administration of approximately $26 million in funds distributed in increments from $50 to $2,500 to approximately 60,000 residents across the region. Urban has collaborated with the foundation to publish two reports telling the story of these strategies to raise and coordinate funding from a wide range of individual and individual institutional donors for rapid, flexible, and equitable recovery efforts during the pandemic. We hope this set of case study provides a new model of the role private philanthropy can choose to play in responding to crises. So now I'm gonna introduce the urban team that will start this off, and then others will introduce the panel of practitioners that we'll hear from afterwards. Um, we have a terrific group, Ben Saskis, who is a senior research associate in our Center on Nonprofits and Philanthropy. Faye Walker, a research analyst in the Metropolitan Housing and Communities Policy Center here at Urban, and Sonia Torres Rodriguez, who's a research assistant in the same center. 
They'll provide some context for today's discussion with the presentation of their research. So let me thank you again for being here and please join me in welcoming them all. Sonia, take it away. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, Hi, my name is Sonia Torres Rodriguez and I use she they pronouns and I'm a research assistant here at Urban and the Metropolitan Housing and Communities Policy Center. I'm excited to present a report authored by Mary Vogel and myself titled Direct Cash Transfer as a Vehicle for Speed, Inclusivity and Equity. Next slide, please. As I am presenting, feel free to scan the QR code of our report for future reading. Our report covers five main direct cash transfer projects that were created or facilitated by the Greater Washington Community Foundation in the DC, Maryland, and Virginia era, area during the pandemic. Our main contribution to the field with this report is tracking how speed, inclusion, and equity were main motivators for philanthropists facilitating these programs and how collaboration with trusted partners can be key in recruitment and disbursement of funds. Faye and Ben will expand on these few motivations in their research presentations, as well as an additional motivation of choice. Although our scope was limited to the greater DC region, our report provides a useful regional case study that reflects a larger trend of direct cash transfer or direct cash relief initiatives. We know of similar pandemic cash transfer programs being led by the community foundations in New York, California, and Houston, as well as other philanthropic and local government-led pandemic initiatives across the nation, uh, some of which you will also hear about on the panel today. Next slide, please. I would like to ground our research presentations in our panel today by acknowledging what exactly we mean when we say compounding crises. People of low income, especially Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and AAPI communities have experienced disproportionate COVID-19 deaths, cases, unemployment, and layoffs. Food insecurity has remained entrenched and savings have dwindled as we face a higher frequency of police-involved violence, climate disasters, and evictions. Uh, I wanna emphasize that the murders of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and many other black Americans, as well as the health crisis of 2020, were especially catalytic in terms of shifting the priorities of philanthropists and local governments towards revisiting this idea of direct cash transfers. Next slide. Amidst these compounding crises, some Americans discovered that in addition uh, to experiencing the situation, they were not eligible for uh, pandemic federal assistant. A blog listed in the federal publications expands on this topic, but basically CARE Act's legislation and expanded eligibility requirements for unemployment insurance excluded people such as undocumented immigrants, mixed status families until December for the CARES Act, and it also excluded uh, cash-based workers such as street vendors, domestic care workers, sex workers, and additionally returning citizens without a recent work history. Uh, next slide. So keeping this in mind that there were people who were both experiencing these compounding crises and also were excluded from federal pandemic assistance, uh, we come to this table where we see that the Greater Washington Community Foundation helped support or facilitate a variety of programs that uh, had direct cash transfer uh, initiatives in them. These programs included the DC CARES Phase 1 and Phase 2 program located in DC, the Fairfax Excluded Workers Program located in Virginia, the Montgomery County Emergency Assistance Relief Program in Maryland, Neighbors in Dire Need located in Maryland, and BMC CARES, which was located across the greater DC region. Here we see a wide variety of funders, which included national funders like the Open Society Foundation, local governments such as Events DC and the Office of the Mayor in DC, Montgomery County or Fairfax County, and also regional funders such as the Bernstein Management Corporation. On average, these programs provided one disbursement and they averaged between $500 and $2,500 uh, in terms of amounts and were delivered by prepaid gift card check or ACH transfer. Next slide, please. Across the programs, it was difficult to calculate an approximate amount of people engaged and allocated funds due to flexible reporting requirements and other data collection challenges. However, we wanted to provide a brief estimate. We found that $26 million were allocated for these programs uh, by funders associated with the Greater Washington Community Foundation, excluded the COVID-19 
Response Fund, which you can learn more about in one of the related publications. And about 60,000 individuals were engaged, excluding the, those individuals engaged through the Montgomery County Emergency Assistance Relief Payment Program. Next slide, please. We found that speed was one of the primary motivations for the funders that we interviewed. This quote is from Tonya Wellens, the president and CEO of the Greater Washington Community Foundation, who, by the way, is in our excellent panel today. So you'll get to hear uh, more about her from this. But the main idea I want you to draw from it is that we witnessed uh, previous crises in the past and that there was already some framework and infrastructure that the pandemic helped kind of catalyze a movement towards very quick transfer to people who needed money in their hands immediately. Next slide. Inclusivity was also a primary motivation. As I mentioned uh, with the definition that I gave of excluded workers, many people who were uh, experiencing all of these compounding crises were also excluded from federal pandemic assistance. So a big motivation for many of our funders that we interviewed was also bringing them in and at least minimum providing them the same level of assistance that other people were receiving through things like unemployment insurance. Next slide. Um, so the quote on this slide is an excerpt from Fairfax County's One Fairfax Policy, stating their equity objectives for all of their programming across the county. And what I'd like to show is that equity was not only a primary motivation, but that it also connects to uh, existing uh, efforts existing at the city level. So it shows how this particular motivation is amenable to current city-based equity efforts that could be a great place to partner uh, with philanthropic funded or supported cash transfer programs, which is another thing that I hope to hear from our panelists today. Next slide. Finally, I will close by saying that speed, inclusion, and equity as primary motivations in this work drove folks to collaborate with trusted local partners as well. For instance, funders found it easier to connect with local communities through partners. For example, Fairfax County Excluded Workers Program works through three nonprofit partners, Fairfax Casa, Ayuda, and El Futuro, all of who also did check-ins with undocumented workers to see how they were faring during this period of time. Advocating for the standing up of funds was facilitated through local nonprofits also. Um, it's important to know that for the DC CARES program, uh, a coalition of 60 plus organizations came together to stand up these funds and that the distribution partners ended up being some of the people who advocated for those funds. This included Bread for the City, Mary Center, Centronia, Central American Resource Center, Carecen, the Latin American Youth Center and the Far Southeast Family Strengthening Collaborative, which is added in phase two. Next slide, please. So that's it for me. Thank you so much. I wanted to share the related publications that I mentioned in my presentation. And now I will introduce research analyst Faye Walker, who will be conducting our next research presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sonia. Hi, everyone. My name is Faye Walker. I'm a research analyst at the Urban Institute. And today I'm going to be talking about uh, direct cash transfers as a vehicle for speed, inclusivity, and choice. And so we are going to be talking about a report that myself and Mary Bogle authored. Next slide, please. Um, that was called Funding Direct Cash Initiatives. There's a QR code that you can also scan that will take you directly to that report. Um, but what this report looked at specifically was the Thrive East of the River Partnership. So Thrive was a partnership between four community-based organizations, CDOs, and they are uh, Martha's Table, the 11th Street Bridge Park, Far Southeast Family Strengthening uh, Collaborative and Bread for the City. And these core organizations came together at the beginning of the pandemic to start a cash pilot and they were able to raise over $4 million um, in the, over the course of the past uh, year plus. And we spoke to donors to the program as well as leaders um, at the organizations to better understand what was it that compelled people to give to this program specifically and even if this is narrow in scope, what are the larger implications for cash programs across the country? Next slide, please. So what we found was that there was um, three kind of big um, reasons for giving. And so that was speed, which Sonia mentioned, it was uh, equity and it was choice. And as far as speed, um, Sonia spoke to this well, but basically, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, organizations were really working to get cash into the hands of the people that needed it most quickly. And so we saw that with, in part, the rationale for the stimulus checks, 
Um, but we also just saw that a lot of communities that were already hard hit were struggling and we need to get that cash out quickly. And so here we have a quote from one CBO leader as well as one quote from a donor. Um, just kind of speaking to what was it that people needed and how is it that cash was able to be the quickest way for people to get the cash, get resources to those who needed it quick. Um, next slide, please. So what did Thrive actually provide and what was it doing? So Thrive was providing emergency cash assistance to over 500 households. Um, and so what that consisted of was $5,500 in total. So that could either be in one lump sum payment or in monthly payments of about $1,100 a month over the course of five months. It was also weekly groceries and dry goods. And then it was connecting participants to a service navigator that could help them ensure that they wouldn't be losing their other benefits as a result of receiving the $5,500. So really with this cash, they were able to provide them with the resources, provide them with food, provide them with cash, and make sure that they weren't losing what they already were receiving quickly. Next slide, please. As far as equity, here is one quote from a, a CBO leader, just essentially speaking to uh, the fact that we needed to get the cash to the people who needed it. And especially after George Floyd's murder, there was a lot of focus on making sure that we were also getting it to the people that needed it most. <clears throat> and so the eligibility thresholds for Thrive were actually fairly minimal. It, it was essentially that the participants had to have a connection to one of the CBOs already. Um, they had to make less than 50% of the area median income, and they had to live in Ward 8 in DC. And so what that meant when, in terms of who actually got the money, next slide please, um, was that it disproportionately went to um, low income black women who receive social safety nets and who have families larger than four people. So that means that as compared to both Ward 8 as a whole, DC as a whole, and nationally, um, the participants were, um, were disproportionately low income black women. So 98% of participants were black, 42% were making less than 10K a year, 75% plus were receiving some sort of social safety net benefit. Uh, and that in turn, oh sorry, next slide please. And the last point of equity was also very connected to kind of the, the question of choice. So Thrive was founded with kind of three core tenants in mind. So it was, we value the power of our residents to make their own decisions. We treat our community with respect. We will always act with integrity. And we believe in a racially and economically equitable community. And this first tenant, this um, we value the power of our own residents to make their own decisions was really important and something that we kept hearing from donors kind of across the board. Um, that it was important to make sure that that participants were able to do what they wanted with the money and use it however they deemed best. And there are more and more studies that we're seeing coming out of Stockton that actually do show that when participants receive cash, that they're not that they're not using it on luxury goods, that they're using it for housing was one of the number one reasons people were using it, but for kind of basic needs and uh, pressing needs. Um, but most importantly, it kind of brought to light the need for the trust in the participants. Next slide, please. Um, and this trust is also kind of tied to kind of this, the rise in GoFundMes that we see. Essentially, is this way for um, organizations for CBOs, cash transfers to fill in the gaps left by social safety nets. Um, so here's one quote from one of the CBO leaders just saying, one of the fun fundamental ideals is that people can spend these dollars on whatever they choose. And Thrive did kind of keep tabs on how people were spending their money, but it wasn't necessarily to ensure that they were spending it in any specific way. It was just better so that we could understand how the money was being spent. But it was important that uh, Thrive really trust the participants to spend the money in a way that was best for them, that there was no strings attached on how the money be spent. Um, and that it really to connect to kind of, um, or serve in kind of in parallel or in opposition to a social safety net system that often doesn't trust uh, participants, that often it has a lot of means testing um, and that limits them in their capacity to spend the money. And so cash transfers, many donors kept underscoring were really a way for them to provide participants with opportunities to choose however they spend the money in a way that many other benefits were not. And next slide, please. 
Um, and kind of in closing, these are just two kind of different landing pages. One is the Thrive landing page itself, which can take you to a couple of the different related publications, um, blog posts, and upcoming reports, um, as well as a blog focused on building choice, speed, and equity through cash transfers. Um, and I will pass it on to Ben, who will kind of talk about the larger implications for philanthropic giving. Thanks so much, Faye. Um, I'd like to follow up on this really important research that uh, Faye and Sonia have just presented uh, with some broader reflections on the significance um, of the turn to direct cash transfers across the country as a response to the COVID-19 crisis. Next slide. Uh, so these observations come from a report that I wrote uh, earlier in the year on the norms and narratives that shape uh, US charitable and philanthropic giving funded by um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Hewlett Foundation. Uh, in, in that report, I identified uh, the surging popularity of cash transfers as one of the most significant developments in terms of pandemic related shifts of norms and narratives. And what's so striking about this is we saw this turn to cash across the board. Uh, next slide. That is, we saw a range of different forms of cash transfers increase in popularity in terms of varieties and providers, uh, the varieties of providers and platforms. So we saw, we saw small scale cash transfers uh, often targeted um, in spe to specific populations managed by local charities and community foundations. And we also saw larger scale projects run uh, by um, charities like Give Directly, which became a kind of um, a highly celebrated uh, nonprofit getting celebrity endorsements by uh, Ariana Grande and um, among others, um, but also uh, supported by uh, national foundations as well. Um, cash transfers were, of course, one of the major ways that government responded to the pandemic at the local, state, and federal level. Um, sometimes, in fact, as we'll see, in partnership with philanthropy. And there was also a surging interest in universal basic income, you know, UBIs, uh, a type of cash transfer um, that is uh, often recurring uh, and large enough to cover recipients' basic needs. Um, individuals also embrace cash transfers, both major uh, mega philanthropists, but also smaller scale don donors uh, who turn to a peer to peer, -to -peer giving and to crowdfunding on platforms like GoFundMe. It's also uh, striking that uh, this, this support from, for cash came from across the ideological spectrum, uh, such that I really don't think it's possible to talk now about a single politics uh, of cash. Um, cash transfers were embraced uh, by conservative donors um, like uh, the Kochs, uh, but, but were also a key element of many mutual aid networks uh, that were rooted in an ethic of solidarity uh, with uh, offering radical challenges to the status quo and which often operated outside the boundaries of uh, traditional tax exempt um, charitable institutions. I wanna just uh, briefly mention here that this turn uh, to direct cash transfers during the COVID-19 crisis didn't come out of thin air. Uh, it was part of a decades long development um, in some sense starting uh, back with conditional cash transfers sponsored by uh, South and Latin American governments in the 1990s. And uh, then we saw an increasing use of cash as an instrument of humanitarian and disaster uh, relief. We saw the rise of rigorous evaluations that demonstrated the cost effectiveness of, of cash transfers. Um, and so in many respects, uh, things were especially primed uh, for cash to emerge as a uh, charitable and philanthropic uh, instrument uh, for the COVID-19 crisis. Um, next slide. So with that said, I wanna briefly highlight three different ways uh, in which um, we can understand the popularity of cash transfers and, and what uh, that might suggest about shifts in philanthropic norms and practice uh, during the uh, brought about by the pandemic. First, um, I wanna just highlight what it suggests about the ways in which philanthropy is oriented in respect to time. Um, there's been in the past an emphasis on uh, deliberateness as a philanthropic value, on the need for philanthropy to take longer timeframes, um, to take the long view 
uh, that markets and governments because of various pressures couldn't. But even before the pandemic, there was a growing emphasis on responsiveness as a philanthropic imperative, um, a need to act quickly in response uh, to crises in ways that government and markets often could not. And that shift could have uh, profound consequences for the ways in which philanthropy regards its own responsibilities moving forward. Uh, the second is this idea of the relationship between charity and philanthropy. For a long time, philanthropy's identity has been premised on its definition against an ethic of charity. And this ethic of charity was often understood in terms of the direct um, provision of material relief to address an immediate, lead, uh, immediate needs, um, often you know, in its most absolute form, uh, understood as almsgiving. Um, but what we've seen during this pandemic, but during this, the COVID-19 crisis, um, is that, uh, that whereas you know, philanthropy often understood itself to be defined against charity uh, in, in its, um, it, its uh, addressing root causes and, and you know, getting to, the, to kind of the essence of uh, structural reforms, we've seen a kind of bridging of that divide uh, and, and an understanding of the ways in which um, addressing immediate needs could be actually a partner and not a rival uh, to efforts to address structural reform. I think that's also a, a very profound uh, shift. Uh, the third is this idea uh, of a movement really across the board towards trust-based giving. Um, with philanthropy, the most obvious manifestation of this has been uh, the push for donors to give unrestricted general operating support. Um, but cash transfers are another version, another manifestation of trust-based giving, um, rooted in the trust placed in recipients to spend funds as they see best. Um, for some, this means um, respecting the agency and autonomy um, as, uh, of recipients um, really has an instrumental value. It, it, it achieves outcomes that are better. But um, there's also a sense in which uh, the, that um, cultivating trust and respecting um, agency are goods in and of themselves. Um, and, uh, and in that case, I think the, the rise of trust-based giving um, and of, of direct cash transfers itself can pose a challenge to philanthropy more generally, especially in its more technocratically rooted instantiations. Um, which leaves us with a, a final question. Uh, next slide. Uh, what's next? Um, so what will the longer term consequences be of these norm shifts? Um, will the popularity of cash transfers continue or will it be understood as kind of bounded by um, the, the pandemic as a crisis? Now, if cash is understood as a crisis response, um, the answer to that question will also depend on what we, uh, how we understand what constitutes a crisis, which crisis, uh, which crises are, are foregrounded, um, not just pandemics or natural disasters, but crises of economic precarity and racial injustice might also demand cash as a response. And I think we can all agree that these don't have clear terminal uh, points. I wanna suggest one more way that cash transfers could potentially uh, shape philanthropic practice after the pandemic subsides. And that's as a sort of uh, programmatic benchmark. Um, much like uh, an individual investor really um, should be able to beat returns on an index fund in order uh, before they wade into you know, retail investing. Because we now have a relatively good sense of the cost effectiveness of cash transfers, um, aid agencies uh, and humanitarian agencies um, have begun to ask whether their favored programs can beat cash. Now, even if philanthropies no longer continue to sub actively support cash transfers after the pandemic ends, I'm hoping that something of this benchmark approach will persist. The idea of cash, of cash transfers will force funders to really think about how they can justify their own programs shaped by their particular prerogatives and perspectives, as opposed to just giving people money. Often, I think there will be a, a strong justification, but sometimes there won't be. But in either case, I think that will be a salutary and perhaps sobering exercise for funders to take on. And uh, with uh, those remarks, I will turn things over to my uh, colleague, uh, Sheena Ashley, uh, who directs 
Urban Center on Nonprofits and Philanthropy, who will be moderating what really should be a fantastic uh, discussion. Thank you so much, Ben. I really appreciate that assessment and analysis of the norms and really thankful to Faye and Sonia for such terrific presentations on the practice that we've seen so far. I'd like to take this time to invite our panelists to all join on screen and also encourage you as participants to go ahead and keep the Q&A going. We are um, having a lively discussion in the Q&A and we really appreciate your input. Um, we'll also have a time after our panel discussion to address some of the questions that are not addressed um, so far as we are going through. Let me introduce our panelists. This is gonna be a great discussion to follow on to that research. Mary Bogle uh, is a Principal Research Associate here at the Urban Institute. Um, Mary was the Principal Investigator for the evaluation you heard of the Thrive East of the River Program and led the study on the cash transfers of the Greater Washington Community Foundation during the pandemic. Thank you, Mary, for leading the great work that has led to those insights. Kevin Callahan is joining us. He's the Newark Philanthropic Liaison, Council of New Jersey Grantmakers and Office of the Mayor in Newark. Kevin has played a key role in developing the Newark Guaranteed Income Program, which is a member of Mayors for Guaranteed Income. So really looking forward to hearing more about that perspective on this work. We have my dear friend, Nisha Patel, uh, who's joining us from Creative Catalyst, powered by Shakti. Nisha is a philanthropic advisor to donors focused on increasing income and assets for families with children. She builds on her experience working with cash transfer programs. She advised to thrive east of the river on fundraising and program development. And among her many previous career roles, she was the executive director of the US Partnership on Mobility from Poverty here at the Urban Institute as well as the director of the Office of Family Assistance within the US Department of Health and Human Services during the Obama administration. So she'll be able to bring that very local level assessment here and federal level perspective. We have Paula Sammons, program officer from the WK Kellogg Foundation. Pa Paula is the program officer for the Magnolia Mothers Trust, which we heard about earlier, a high profile longstanding cash for transfer effort that was underway prior to the COVID-19 pandemic until we can learn some things about what the state of practice was before and during the pandemic. Uh, we have Tonya Welland, uh, Chief Executive Officer, fabulous CEO of the Greater Washington Community Foundation. And we'll jump right into a really lively discussion across so many perspectives to add to this. Let's start our discussion. Just, we have so many private funders uh, listening in and watching this, this panel discussion right now. Let's really start in on how they can use direct giving to address ongoing crises that we have related to racial injustice, structural inequities, and the economic fallout from disasters like COVID-19 and our continued disasters as we try to address climate change. Tonya, let me start with you. We've said so many things about the Community Foundation. Tell us more about the populations who received cash transfers via the funds administered and facilitated by the Community Foundation. Is it typical for community foundations to enter partnerships like the ones Sonia described in her presentation? Good afternoon, and uh, thank you, Sheena, for the introduction, and a huge thanks to uh, the Urban Institute for helping us to document our work. Uh, we really appreciate the partnership um, with you all that we've had throughout this, this pandemic. Um, I will say, um, Sheena, to start that I it is typical for community foundations to, you know, to be in the middle of a, a crisis response. Um, our community foundation, for example, um, we just did a, a, a commemoration of the 9-11 uh, attacks and the work that our, our foundation was involved in with supporting survivors in the, um, the, the greater Washington region. Um, it is not uncommon for, um, for foundations, community foundations especially, to figure out how do you work with government? How do you work with individual givers? Um, how do you work with the private sector to respond to, um, to community needs? I will say that it is unique and we began the path of trying to figure out how to do um, cash transfer work during the federal government shutdown uh, in 2019. Um, we were, you know, it was the first time that for such a long and extended period of time that people across the socioeconomic um, levels were impacted and needed, you know, their payments were stopped and they needed cash. 
Uh, and we didn't figure it out. We didn't get it right during um, the federal government shutdown. We figured out how to get resources to small businesses, et cetera, but not to individuals. And the community, the, the philanthropic community had not yet warmed up to it. But we spent time, and I'll say the local Washington region philanthropic community spent time after the federal government shut down, laying the groundwork and the foundation such that when the next crisis came, we'd be primed for it. And so we were, we were ready. We had done some additional work and the community um, sort of called us to it. Our nonprofit community said, listen, we need to do something differently to get resources to, to, in the hands of people who need it. And so who did we serve? We served excluded workers, um, many of whom as, as the research shows were ineligible for benefits like unemployment or federal assistance, um, workers who were COVID positive and it, had experienced a loss of income, um, workers who lost their job, you know, restaurant workers, childcare professionals and others who were hard hit by the immediate impact of, of COVID-19, um, tenants pre-eviction moratorium. Um, remember there was a period before the eviction moratorium was put in place, before unemployment benefits were put in, in place. We were trying to help, you know, at most who had needs um, to be able to get through the immediate portion, the immediate period of, of COVID-19. That's great. And it's really wonderful to hear how your preparedness in this moment built on uh, years of preparation and trying to do this in response in different crises and the timing of this just sort of aligned where you were prepared and you could use that tool that you have been building in your toolbox um, when the moment needed it. That's wonderful. So Nisha, let's turn to you and bring you into the conversation. You provided important guidance and support to the very rapid fundraising effort for a Thrive East of the River. As we heard in the presentation, donors to Thrive were very concerned about racial equity and liked how the community-based organization's values emphasize the freedom of choice and flexibility. Tell us more about how Thrive aligned with donor concerns in these areas. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, Sheena, you mentioned one of my many previous roles as executive director of the US Partnership on Mobility from Poverty at Urban. And one of the things that that two year plus effort did was to put forward a broader definition of mobility that I'm now seeing sort of three years on um, the framework getting taken up by lots of philanthropies. And that definition was that mobility is not just economic success. Yes, it is that, that is fundamental. It is about income and assets. But there are two other really important pieces. And there's a second piece of that definition, which says that mobility is also about power and autonomy. It's about agency. And then third, it is about being valued in community um, or about social capital and social connection. And what's interesting is that cash hits all of those three things. It's very obvious. If a person doesn't have income, cash helps to fill that gap. And that was certainly true for many people in our region in DC, but across the country but it's the ultimate agency. And I think, it, you know, particularly in a crisis that was heightened, but as was referenced, there are a number of funders, those that are supporting Magnolia Mothers Trust, those are, that supported the Stockton experiment, those that are supporting the mayors for guaranteed income um, pilots around the country that sort of saw this pre-pandemic. And I think it just heightened it, that when there's a crisis, trying to quickly help, help individuals, help families, who knows better than that person what they need and what their family needs. You can provide food, but perhaps what another person needs is to pay their rent. Perhaps what they need to do is to be able to buy diapers. Perhaps they're at, they don't have the luxury of working from home, but they, they're an essential worker. And guess what? Childcare is closed. So you have a child care subsidy that you now can't use. You have to find someone that you can pay cash to, to, to take care of your children, you know, or take care of the elders or your family members with disabilities that need care while you're having to go out and do your essential job. And so that essential agency that cash provides, I think resonated with a lot of funders who, some of who saw it before, but then in the, in the midst of the crisis saw it very clearly. And I love your framework or Urban's framework around speed, inclusivity and equity. So on that equity piece, I think it was very clear, um, particularly for those of us in DC, this is not a, a new phenomenon during the pandemic, it is very clear that there are folks in our community who are most locked out of opportunity. And there's great data from urban, from, from you know, uh, urban greater Washington. You can look at the data and see very, very clearly 
that in the district, it is black, black people. And it's interesting, Thrive hit exactly the population, black women, black mothers who are who pre-pandemic were most locked out of the you know, opportunity for some that's been increasing in our region. And those residents in Ward 7 and 8. And because it's that is so clear to anyone that is working in this region, that was known pre-pandemic. And I think the, the four organizations that stood up Thrive East of the River one of the things for many uh, donors that, you know, has been referenced that have begun to operate with a trust-based uh, framework. One of the tenets of trust-based philanthropy is doing the homework. So I think many funders already had done the homework. They knew that these were four trusted nonprofits that had decades of track record working in the city, engaging residents, and very clearly were specifically doing deep work in Ward 7 and 8, had those trusted relationships. So in some ways it was it really wasn't, um, I think, a giant leap for, for funders that were in the know to say, this is these are exactly the organizations that have the boots on the ground, have the relationships, are connected to families, um, and very specifically, are, many of them are Black-led organizations working in neighborhoods, engaging Black families. And so, uh, you know, the, the values and principles that were talked about before, but also just the, the track record. It's like, if you've done your homework, you knew that, and it and it was and it was. I think you know once a, a few early stage funders um, got dollars in the door, I think that made other funders start to pay attention and say, "Oh, okay." It, you know, that's I think another piece often for funders. Funders love nothing more than leverage and to collaborate. And when they saw a few early folks in the door, it was like, "Okay, this is this is something we can get behind." We're not actually doing this alone. There are a lot of us in here co-investing. That's right. And it takes sort of a convener of that and someone to set that table in the way the Community Foundation helped do to bring that interest together and to start aligning philanthropic effort with the shifts and norms that been talked about in terms of seeing things like trust based philanthropy and this norm that you're saying with power building and agency um, becoming more recognized as we've shifted our frameworks to understand that that is part of mobility. Really appreciate that. Paula, let's bring you in to take us from DC to have a more national perspective on this um, and even a, a deep dive into Mississippi where your, the um, initiative uh, Mother's Magnolia Trust uh, is located and where you are the program officer at Kellogg for this effort. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about this effort and how it has aligned with the goals of the Kellogg Foundation? You know, what key takeaways about direct giving do you have to share about how national funders, big, large national funders that are not embedded in this place, um, what do they bring to this effort and what's encouraging to them about participating in direct cash giving? Yeah, so as a national funder, um, we're really excited to be supporting this uh, guaranteed income, the Mother's Magnolia Trust. I think especially... Um, around the equity frame and giving these, uh, you know, African-American mothers agency and voice. Um, Aisha Neodoro, she talks about how it's radically resident driven and they're really confronting the criminalization of poverty in America. Um, so, you know, it's aligned in a number of ways for us. So one, um, I think, you know, our mission is focused on children. And so we, of course, wanna make sure for thriving children that they have economically secure parents. We know that infusing income and cash into families when children are in poverty and ch or children are very young um, has long-term term payoffs, both now with brain development and then in future earning potential. Um, so that is critically important. Um, and I think, um, you know, this trust-based philanthropy and these mothers, um, you know, being able to make the choice about what they need, um, they know exactly what's going on in their lives. Uh, you know, we, we need to really take heed and listen to that. Um, and I think the results speak for themselves. You know, we have been funding the quasi-experimental uh, evaluation of this effort. And, you know, we're seeing that um, some of the results are, you know, mothers are paying their bills on time going from 27% to 83%. Um, you know, that they are uh, saving money for emergencies from 40% to 88% that went up. And uh, their children are doing better in school, they're getting jobs, they're getting training. And so I think um, this effort is a way to really, um, you know, showcase that, you know, we need to give uh, 
you know, these mothers, the agency and voice that they need to, to solve their problems and also to shine a spotlight, I think, on some of the uh, public policies and this social safety net, the, all the requirements and work requirements that are not uh, working so well. I think one of the things um, Aisha also had shared is that, you know, she'd been working with these mothers for, for you know, at least a decade and with all the wraparound supports and the, you know, their public housing residents and they're, they were having trouble kind of climbing out of poverty to mobili more mobility. And um, part of that, you know, so she's like, what is happening here? What do you need? And, and you know, part of what they needed was cash. They needed that flexibility. Um, so that is really, really important. And I think um, in terms of, you know, key takeaways, I think there's millions of people across the country that, that are, you know, have needs and are deserving of help, but not judgment. Um, these pilots like Magnolia Mother's Trust uh, policies like the child tax credit and, you know, the recurring direct checks that can, you know, provide so many families with help. Um, this pandemic is showing us you know, what we know to be true, that cash gives people the tools to solve their own problems. Um, direct cash payments have driven um, poverty reduction, boosted local economies. Um, and it's also a lifeline. Um, we know during crises like the pandemic, um, economic recessions and fills that gap. And I think it's time to relegate uh, punitive and sometimes racist policies um, in, into the history books, you know, and, and really lead with e equity, um, trust and dignity for, for people and residents. Paula, thank you. They're deserving of help, but not judgment like all of us. <laughs> and thank you for raising Aisha. Shout out to her, graduate of HBCU, Tennessee State University. <laughs> So let's let's think about all the partners involved. We've been thinking about philanthropists and um, making the funds available, but really the success of a lot of these um, projects deserve some uh, partnership or require partnership between funders, city, county governments, nonprofits, and community members in order to be successful. Kevin, let's bring you in and, and tell us a little bit more about your role as a philanthropic liaison, that's a role that I think is definitely needed in so many more places. Um, what sort of relationships do you broker in that role and why? And also give us some intel into the newer Guaranteed Income Program um, and what the relationship that program has with the Mayors for Guaranteed Income. Sure, so thanks so much for uh, having me join today. Uh, so my role is very unique. Uh, it's actually based on a role in Michigan, a foundation liaison role, but it's existed in Newark under the Council of New Jersey Grantmakers for over a decade. And uh, so I've been in this position for five years. And really what my job is, is to connect uh, the office of the mayor with our uh, private foundation community, whether it's uh, in the city, in the state, nationally, um, and really try to leverage uh, their dollars as best as possible to achieve uh, gold for the residents of the city and also to uh, try and test uh, and pilot uh, new innovative things that we really feel like uh, are due, but we know that sometimes government dollars are hard to spend on them and we need some of those philanthropic dollars to help us uh, to try out some new initiatives. And I think that, you know, guaranteed income really fell uh, into that sweet spot where it was something that our mayor really decided to prioritize relatively early on um, after seeing Stockton, you know, he called for it in 2019. Um, and I think back then some people still thought he was crazy and it was crazy. And so we've really come to an amazing point, I think in two years where this is starting to become more of the national dialogue. Uh, but what we did was we put together a cross-sector task force. Um, and so we had 30 people that met about once a month and wrestled with the economic precarity that our residents were living with and what the possible solutions were. And we talked about what guaranteed income is and what it's not and how it's different from a universal basic income. And we really built a lot of support uh, in our community and from our community-based organizations around the idea of a guaranteed income pilot. Um, and so I think that you know having an office like this, building partnerships, working with nonprofits, government, across sectors, and really bringing, able to bring everyone together was critical to the launch that we had in Newark, which was, uh, you know, really we released our report just as the pandemic had hit. And uh, it was pushed off a little bit actually by the pandemic. So June of, of 2020, we released our report recommending a guaranteed income pilot. And, you know, I have to be totally honest, I don't know if we would have gotten funding without um, uh, the George Floyd incident uh, and what happened in the aftermath and without 
the pandemic. Um, you know, I think that people were skeptical whether or not we would raise funds to do a guaranteed income pilot. But those two things happening, the formation of mayors for a guaranteed income uh, really helped us to raise $2.4 million privately, uh, fill in ARP funding and, and launch a pilot with 400 residents. So uh, starting next month, 400 residents in Newark will be receiving a guaranteed income. We started with an early cohort in May with 30 residents who are already receiving uh, payments. And we're very excited with our plan. Uh, we are testing some different things. We're giving different payment frequencies to people to really get a sense of those ideal times uh, to give out money, whether it's lump sum or whether it's biweekly. Uh, we're focusing on a housing insecure population, which is very fitting for Newark, but also the rest of the country. Um, and we're really looking forward to how we can spread those lessons um, around the rest of the country. And so that's where Mayors for a Guaranteed Income comes in. 60 plus mayors, uh, you know, really making cities as, as labs of innovation, pushing for this policy that we know needs to happen on a national level, and really pushing for this idea across the board of, of more policy that is informed by giving people more cash with less strings attached. So we talked about the child tax credit. You know, there are many ways you can do this, but the idea is really about giving more agency and voice and power to people who are affected by this. And we see that when you do a program like this, the money goes out much faster than when you're doing something like rental assistance or unemployment assistance, where we see all of those bottlenecks. And so we really feel like it's a time that's come. We couldn't have done it without Mayors for Guaranteed Income in this national network. So I encourage everyone to you know, check out the national network and see what other mayors are involved. But we're very proud of the work that we're doing in Newark. That's wonderful, Kevin. Congratulations on that raise and um, of capital and also just looking forward to the, all the learnings that will come out of this. I really appreciate the way that you guys are shaping it so that there are insights that can be gathered in terms of variation and helping us understand what works. Mary, you've been tracking these things across different places. Uh, are we learning anything at the intersection of cash transfer pilots and public policy? What trends do you see emerging at this intersection? Are we on to something? Is this a thing that philanthropy is innovating and driving and building the case for, um, and then we're going to get public policy uptake. You're on mute. Okay, sorry. Um, I think the answer to all that, Tonya, is yes. Um, I used to run an organization many years ago called Grant Makers for Children, Youth and Families. It was a foundation affinity group. And one of the things philanthropists most hoped for, I could tell, you know, whenever we ran an event or whatever was to sort of seed innovation. Like philanthropy understood that the dollars philanthropy could put in might run out, but what could be sort of thread up into the public policy system. And I'm not sure, and Ben alluded to this in his presentation, I've ever seen anything quite like how much philanthropy has been able to do that. Because as was discussed earlier, you know, in the Stockton Magnolia Mothers Trust, you know, going back to uh, Carnegie funded um, uh, things in New York City, um, there's been a lot of private dollars behind experimenting with cash transfer before we ever got to the pandemic. And now we see with the American Rescue Plan and the fiscal recovery funds that really 130 billion of which went to localities, there are all kinds of cities, you know, getting skin in the game directly now. Um, we're seeing it in Minneapolis, you know, early, the, there's, they're getting their American Rescue Plan funds in two tranches. So in the early tranches, we're seeing some early pilots in places like Minneapolis, uh, Mountain View, California, Seattle. There's, there's a very noted one in uh, the, the DC region in Alexandria uh, about to launch to about 150 families, a pilot. Um, the most interesting policy innovations and questions going on within these pilots, and Paula alluded to this in her comments, are looking at how the safety net um, programs, uh, like food stamps, uh, childcare, housing, rental subsidies, interact with cash transfer. What we're seeing in a lot of these pilots is that they're going after waivers from their states. Uh, and where they can't get waivers, because it's a very catch as catch can. I mean, if a human services department gives a procedural, you know, uh, authority, 
as in the case of Alexandria, you can wave a lot, but there are still some things that you can't wave. And so again, philanthropy can come in, help with research, help with outreach and help with things like hold harmless funds for where if families do find that some of the, one of their benefits is impacted, the whole harmless fund can come in and fill in. I know Stockton had one thrive, uh, stood one up because there was a lot of fear even um, in at the beginning of the pandemic before we saw things like the moratoriums and the medical emergency declared, you know, Medicaid was the one we really feared and thrive was if you couldn't, if a family got sick with COVID or anything and they had, been disallowed from their Medicaid benefits in that month, they couldn't recertify and recoup a $50,000 medical bill. So I think these cliff effect experiments and things like that, we're gonna start seeing, especially as the, as the next tranche of American Rescue Plan funds come out, we're gonna start seeing state level experiments, especially in states that are belong to the Aspen Institute Ascend two generation network that I work with a lot looking at, you know, how do you get families, how do you bridge them over these cliffs where they lose so much benefit? And by the way, a lot of folks in the safety net in this country also work. Uh, we see an enormous number of people who are working and on things like food stamps. So it's not like folks are sitting back saying, let me grab benefits. It's they're trying to get to the mobility, but we find is the safety net isn't a trampoline. It's a sticky web people get stuck in because they're trying to survive and come up with a budget that they can survive on. And as their income rises from new work, they can't bridge to mobility. And so a lot of these experiments I think we're about to see are gonna go straight head on at that question and I can't wait. Nisha, can you add to that as a former administrator of TNF? What are you seeing here as the verticals to this? Is this something local partnerships need to be looking in terms of? We talked about CDC, CTC. We've talked about a number of federal programs that are doing direct cash. Where do you see the potential linkages here? Yeah, I definitely see the, the through line from these you know small on the ground pilots to big federal policy. And I think what I would say sort of succinctly, like when I think about what are the big federal programs we have had or, and are in the process of implementing to provide direct cash to families and particularly families with children, which is really my area of expertise. TANF is the case of a case example of what not to do. And the child tax credit, I think is becoming the example of what to do, right? So TANF is, is the opposite of um, a, a basic, a, a unconditional, right? Uh, basic income program. It is a program that, first of all, it's it's scattershot depending on what state you're in. So there's huge variation. There are enormous hoops for families to jump through to get very meager benefits. And so in a state, you know, we talked about the Magnolia Mothers Trust. In a state like Mississippi, even if, you know, for those moms talking to Asia, if they lose their benefit, their TANF benefits, if they were getting them in the first place, which very few families are, they're actually still better off. Now in a place like DC, which has much more generous benefits and actually is trying to provide a more holistic program, it would be a bigger loss, but you still have, um, you know, you have this cliff effect that Mary mentioned. The child tax credit comes with none of that. It comes with no strings, right? It's run through the tax code. It's direct cash with the new expanded program. It's advanced payments that families can get if they've got a bank account and set up for direct deposit. If they've got a child um, under six, $300 a month. If they've got a child between six and 17, $250 a month. So that's cash that's available monthly, just like, you know, Thrive, just like Magnolia Mothers Trust, that, that families can choose to spend on what they want. And it's very clear, these are dollars that come direct from the federal government. So that's another issue. It's not run through the states. It's a federal benefit, direct people. And it has no impact. It's very, it's stated very clearly in the policy. If you receive a child tax credit payment, it explicitly does not affect your eligibility for TANF, for SNAP, for SSI, for Medicaid, for a range of other benefits. And I think that's an important lesson in how we ought to be thinking about structuring our policies. If we want them to be additive, if we want them, as Mary said, to be promoting mobility, to be a trampoline versus that, that sticky floor, that sticky web, then we've got to create policies that add up in that way, as opposed to policies that work at cross purposes um, with one another. So there's a ton, I think we're already learning with the early data from the child tax credit. We're seeing very similar 
outcomes that we've seen in Stockton that we've seen for Magnolia Mother's Trust in terms of how are families spending the money? They're spending it on food. They're spending it on household expenses. They're spending it on school supplies for their children. And I think, I think we're gonna to start to see more and more of that. We're also seeing outcomes from the um, basic income pilots that I would were, if I were a predicting person, and I guess I will be, I would imagine we'll start to see with the child tax credit, which is a reduction in anxiety, in depression, right? All of these stressors, like money is a stressor for most people. And we know that that financial stress on parents then has an impact on the next generation. And so when you think about what the ROI is um, for these kinds of investments, I mean, it is enormous. It, it is beyond, yes, reducing child poverty by 50%. I don't, if you're not in support of that, then I just, I don't understand you, but that's a reason to get behind it. But I think we'll have even more and more spinoff positive effects coming from this. Please yeah, jump in, I, Paula, Tanya, I think, jump in. Um, that's also why Magnolia's Mother Trust, they wanted to, to do the payments at $1,000 a month because they knew that there would be loss of the public benefits, right? And I think that whole criminalization of poverty, it's like, it, it is intentional to make it very hard for people to climb out of poverty. Um, and the cliff effect is just, you know, a huge example. And I know in Mississippi, um, you know, there's mothers who are waiting to get that child care subsidy. And by, by the time they fi it finally comes through three to six months later, they had to drop out of the job training program. So one of the things we're funding is a child care bridge grant that the, all the mothers in this program, it's actually a Mississippi Low Income Child Care Initiative, are getting this child care bridge grant to hold them over until they get their subsidy because it's just it's just a continuous cycle. It's very frustrating. Great, Tanya, you wanted to add in something? Yeah, there? I just, I love the quote um, from one of the community members. It says, people aren't exploiting the system. The system is exploitative. And um, I think all the points that are raised are just demonstrating that. Um, that we have to make it easier for people to access, you know, cash in the same, maybe cash in the same way that we, that we all need it. Um, you know, I've often said that philanthropy shifted more in the first four months of COVID than we probably had in the prior four years. Um, it was a real, I think it was a, a wake up call for our sector, uh, for our, our broader community. You know, wages haven't kept pace with the cost of living. Like it's just, and if you're poor, particularly in an area like uh, the greater Washington region, where you know 11 of 20 of the wealthiest counties in the country sit, it's really, really difficult to make it here. Um, and we really have to begin to look at ways of you know piling on the benefits rather than than taking them away so that we can create a, a clear path to, um, to economic mo mobility. So before we jump to a great set of fabulous questions we have from our audience, all the panelists, please tell me what's your hope. What is your hope for what comes next um, in this world of direct giving in, in particularly or in your work? Um, how are you, what are the next steps you see for this? I'll jump in um, very quickly. I, philanthropy cannot sustain um, di direct transfers ongoing. We can instigate pilots, we can support um, you know, catalytic initiatives, but we don't have the resources to sustain it. These things have to be picked up at uh, larger systems, at either local government, state governments, federal government systems. To the extent that we could support you know, policy shifts, innovations, um, you know, pilots, we are ready and, and able. And I think the work of the last 18 months has demonstrated a willingness uh, to support that transition and that shift. Um, but we can't support the, we can't underwrite the full cost. My hope is that uh, local governments will uh, and local state and federal governments will will um, step in to help support the transition. Thank you for that. That is definitely important, Paula. Yeah, I think um, we're in a very unique moment in history where um, the deeply entrenched problems of racism, sexism, poverty are were finally being exposed. Um, especially with a broad swath of the population being impacted by COVID. And so it's cracked open this much needed empathy or awakened our leaders after it impacted all of Americans. And we saw the, you know, 
uh, policies that could be passed very quickly to help all Americans. Um, you know, we're investing um, so that we can inform and hopefully change uh, social safety net programs for the better. But I think also this narrative change and um, shift in people's mental models not to, you know, um, criminalize poverty. And now we see that, you know, we all people need help and not judgment. So true, so true. Mary, jump in with a point about equity and safety net programs. Where are you, what are you seeing there? What's your hope? You know, I, in this conversation, one of the reasons, you know, I so much wanted Urban to sponsor it was to make this link between equity and choice. We historically, I mean, a lot of what has happened over the course of the pandemic is people now understand the disproportionality, you know, the average person understands better the disproportionality of things like pandemics and unemployment on people of color in this country. But, you know, the, the problems with our safety net are far more entrenched. You know, it, it took, you know, the George Floyd murder and the pandemic to lift Americans um, awareness more broadly, but you know, back in the 1930s, uh, the widow's pensions, you know, the beginning of AFDC excluded domestic workers in the South. Guess who that was? You know, uh, black mothers, black women. Uh, we come to the 60s when there's the, you know, war on poverty and what do we find? We find man in the house rules that are aimed right at black families. And then we turn around policy, you know, the polity, turns around and says, somehow this is about the recipients. That's their problem. They're, they want temptation goods. Again, research shows people of low income don't indulge in temptation goods when they have additional cash any more than any of us would. Uh, and so we have to stop with these stereotypes, types, acknowledge the structural racism that actually built our safety net, created all these constraints, eligibility caps, and I think, you know, I think philanthropy by inspiring this wave of cash transfer and really bringing it to the fore and now local governments, you know, hopefully it will continue to surface, you know, weave up to the federal level. We're seeing it in the child tax credit um, and that there will be this sea change. I'm really looking forward to a new um, kind of social policy climate going forward that maybe we can really spark that and there could be a substantial reform, not just tinkering here and there. Mary, that is also my, my hope. <laughs> but I must say that the thing that is keeping me from holding that hope too much is that we are seeing, especially this um, an understanding of equity and building it into the systems of government much more at the local level of government. We're seeing a great driver of that in the federal level of government, but we're not seeing it as much in the states. And for us to really change the way safety net programs are delivered in a real orientation, especially a lot of the discretion for all these programs we've been talking about happens at the state level. For us to accomplish that, we're really going to need to hear equity <laughs> become a, really a calling card for folks at the state level. And, and maybe we can, philanthropy's next move is to help inspire that kind of change and really see state level audiences as a place for that. Sorry to jump in as uh, with my hopes, but Nisha, Kevin, give me yours. Well, I think, yeah, I agree with everything that's been said. And I think building on it, I mean, I, I an optimist at heart. So I, I share Mary's hope but I will tell you my, my, my concern, my worry is that 20 years from now, when we look back, I hope we look back and we say, you know what, 2020, 2021, that was a shift. It was a real shift and not a blip. My worry is that it's a blip, that we're at a point in time where public sentiment changes and shifts in a moment because of crisis and then snaps back when, you know, the crisis is no longer impacting the majority of people, but continues to impact folks that are most marginalized, right? So we, we've talked a lot in this conversation and, and Ben mentioned it in his remarks, how when there's a crisis that can lead, lead to an attitude shift. And I was thinking a lot about, you know, on this topic of basic income, um, going back to the US Partnership for Mobility from Poverty, we had a whole set of recommendations. We had a fair amount of conversation about around basic income. Those recommendations came out in 2018, which was a different context than the one we're living in in 2021. 
And we had a lot of recommendations around expanding the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit. We didn't have a, a big, bold, blinking sign saying universal basic income. And why was that? There were two main reasons that a lot of folks felt like, hmm, maybe that's not a recommendation we put forward. Not, not agreement, but some folks felt differently. And the two main arguments against it were, oh, it's not going to be fiscally feasible with the federal budget, right? Not fiscally feasible and not politically feasible. And then the context shifts and all of a sudden it's like, oh, we actually can, we actually can run a deficit. We actually can take on debt as a country to ensure that everyone has enough. Actually, it turns out we could have always done that. We just did it because it was viewed as a crisis for mass numbers of people. But when you look at the data for the last, you know, five decades, you can see that like year upon year, that the black unemployment rate is always 2x the white unemployment rate. Right. So if the white unemployment rate is like four and a half percent at some point, that feels like, OK, relatively low. Some people used to call that full employment. But if it's nine percent, 10 percent for white people, folks would be freaking out. But in many communities, that is always the unemployment rate for black folks. And so it's always a crisis. But we fail. We fail to see that. So I guess my, I'll, I'm turning into a long winded answer. But what I'll say is like. Let's not let this be a blip. Let it, let's, let's push so this is a real shift in the way that we understand the world and that way, the way that we do what I think the Urban Institute does so well is to keep that focus on the data, go back, go back to the facts and keep that front and center in our decision making. Excellent point. I hope it's not a blip. Kevin, please help ensure us with that. Give us your hope and also share with us what you're seeing in the state of New Jersey that might be making this um, more of a shift there. Sure. So, I mean, you know, my big hope is that we really bust a lot of these popular narratives that have been out there uh, in the past, that we change systems, that this is not um, a crisis response, that we really reframe this as uh, the way to move forward to ensure people's dignity, uh, that we show that this is the way um, that systems work, that, that people um, uh, react and, and uh, improve their, their own lives. You know, that's really my ultimate hope for this is to move policy in a real way so that we're not talking about this as one-off programs, but as new systems of intervention and new ways of thinking and ways of thinking that really gets us to the resident level, to the community level and builds those partnerships from the ground up so that people are able to achieve success. You know, in New Jersey, I, I think we are moving in that direction in some ways. We were sure to include in our task force report some additional recommendations beyond the guaranteed income pilot. Uh, and we have seen some policies enacted, whether it's expanding the earned income, income tax credit um, or uh, a baby bond proposal that we've actually seen come out of the governor's office that did not make it this time, but uh, there are always future years. Um, you know, And so it's just in the spirit of policies like that, I think that we're really gonna start to see um, a shift away from some of the more prescriptive policies and towards some of the policies that are much more inclusive of people on the ground and, and allowing people to really make decisions um, over their own lives. And I think that, you know, something that really touches me that I really want to share is a quote I just heard um, in a book I'm listening to on Audible, which is in Newark, by the way. I just want to provide that, that plug. Um, but it's by Shannon Lee. It's about her father, Bruce Lee. Uh, it's called Be Water, My Friend. And she has a quote and she says, being holy ourselves is freedom not being under the control or power of anyone else mentally, emotionally, spiritually, but rather personally permitted to act on behalf of ourselves. So my hope is that we allow everyone to act on behalf of themselves um, because they know what to do. Thank you so much for that quote. I'd love to start seeing that in a, a logic model or theory of change for a foundation <laughs> to say that that's their goal for thriving. I really, really love that. We have panelists, uh, such a great list of questions here for all of you um, and to the audience. We won't be able to get to all of them in the remaining time, but uh, my urban colleagues will definitely send you personalized answers to the ones that we can't get to. Let's start with a question that jumps right off on this point around whether or not this is a blip. Um, you know, folks are acknowledging in the questions that many foundations were willing to fund this when it was crisis response um, in a fast move, and people are starting to pull those programs down. How can we, or do you know of any foundations that have been funding this beyond pandemic relief and are starting to do more longer term initiatives that provide cash assistance? I'll start by saying that the, the giving has certainly slowed 
Um, and you know, for almost all of 2020, we saw a steady flow of, of um, philanthropic gifts to the community foundation for investment in broader, in broader community um, efforts. Giving has certainly slowed. Um, what we are trying to demonstrate through, you know, um, more, uh, less crisis response, but more thoughtful um, reflection on what happened, what, what, where the position that we were in pre-pandemic, pandemic and now about the need for sustained supports. So there are a number of, of pilots that are still ongoing. Uh, there is a new pilot that's going to be kicked off very soon that's going to focus on um, restaurant workers. Um, so there, there are lots of efforts that are still underway that will need sustained investment. And our ambition is to try as much as we possibly can to connect funders who, you know, who get it, who recognize that we've not fully recovered and we're not fully out of the, out of the water to really continue to invest in those efforts. Um, but I can definitely say that things have slowed. Our ambition is to continue to push because people still need money uh, to be able to, to make it through this phase and through the next many years as we um, look toward you know, a, a different kind of recovery, an equitable recovery. I would, I would just add that you know, in, in my role, I often get calls from foundations when there is a crisis and there is always a crisis, right? I mean, we have, we just had a terrible storm hit our country um, and it, you know, New Jersey was particularly hard hit by it. And so there are always things like that that I'm getting calls about. And it's always, well, who do we give money to, right? And so I think what we could really use this to do is build the infrastructure to get money to people quickly, which is what we know that we need to do. And so our guaranteed income pilot is building an infrastructure to get money to people who need it quickly. How do we expand that? So that there's not a phone call, what do I do? But there's immediately money in people's pockets to help them. You know, I think that the trust-based philanthropy movement is gonna be key because I think that that's gonna help to start to get money more into people's pockets. You know, two foundations in New Jersey that I'll call out that have been helpful to us are the Victoria Foundation and the Dodge Foundation. And both of them started on this trust-based philanthropy journey before the pandemic. And so they were ready to, to, to jump into the guaranteed income pilot by the time we did it. But I just think we have to keep building that infrastructure now because there is always gonna be another crisis. And so we need to make it policy. We found that in our um, in the Thrive research is that the fact that the four CBOs had a pre-existing relationship to prevent displacement and they were already looking at cash transfer as a mechanism allowed them to form in the in March 2020. That was right away. So you know I do think that um, being ready, uh, having the right tools at hand is a really important thing. That and and the other thing. So one of the questions, one of the Q and A's was about how do you prioritize um, direct giving to individuals versus you know, grants to grantees like nonprofits. So I can reassure the nonprofit sector that they are very much included in this work uh, as our governments, because the truth is, is that a lot of the cash pilots rely on the nonprofit sector for distribution. I mean, in the, in the, um, report we did for the community foundation and the four CBOs and Thrive, it was, I would call the, the, the CBOs, the nonprofit organizations, the intermediaries who helped to do the outreach, get the money distributed equitably, uh, keep track of things like gift cards. We, I, I, one thing you find out when you enter into any kind of cash transfer work is that it's not as easy to hand out money as you think it is. The platforms, everything else, you actually do need mechanisms. The mutual aid efforts going on across the district for sure swung into action. I know Tonya uh, Foundation funded a great many of those. So there's a real role for the um, nonprofit sector in these sorts of experiments. But again, everybody has to you know, get on the same page and build coalitions early. You don't wait until the next crisis. Right, that's a really good point, Mary, you raised. What are some other um, lessons that you've all learned from nonprofit organizations who've been implementing this? What are some more lessons you've learned from those? And Paula, we, we received a question for you in particular because you raised the quasi um, evaluation that you're doing. You know, what, what kind of feedback is being collected from the recipients of this cash? Yeah, so part of what we're tracking on um, will be around, you know, employment, training, 
um, health and wellness benefits, um, you know, child outcomes. And so we, we funded uh, the evaluation of, you know, the current projects that are happening, but we just now, um, it went active a couple of days ago, is a, more of a, a post evaluation study to try and track these mothers two years after um, these programs have ended. So we're really excited about that. Um, the one thing I, I did just want to say is, um, you know, we, we've been funding, like we funded the conditional cash transfers in the 90s, we funded family independence initiative, um, you know, now we're funding some of the, some of these uh, guaranteed income, the mayor's work, we're going to do a documentary. Um, and I would say, uh, of all the best practices um, that's happening around the country, so we're excited about that. Um, and I would say the one thing, you know, um, part of we as a national foundation, we're thinking about, you know, what what knowledge can we build and evidence can we build to impact public policy? Um, but I would also say, you know, when there are, you know, we certainly upped our giving during the crisis um, with COVID and we, there was also social bond funds we gave. But um, the one thing I was thinking about too that we've been talking about is a disaster recovery endowment. Because like, especially in the South with the storms, there's always gonna be storms and with climate change increasing, like people need cash fast. And, you, you know, as a foundation, it depends on what time of the year it is. Can we, can we find the money? Can we squeeze it out? Can we get it to communities? And how might we be able to think about this, you know, disaster recovery endowment or, you know, cash assistance that's needed to funnel through quickly? Really love the sound of that. We had someone submit a question on a related point around these collection and distribution hubs. We found from individual giving, you know, a mechanism and an infrastructure for um, giving products like diapers and other things really quickly and moving those. And those are kind of sexy. You know, you get a lot of press showing these volunteer work and all of that. How does di direct giving or cash transfer come along, a so along that? Um, and, you know, is this something that we have to uh, help people understand as a different mechanism? What do you think is behind or the um, hesitancy to give cash in this way to help people? Or, you know, is this something we do in parallel? So I'll, I'll just speak to the hesitancy really quickly. And I think it goes back to issues of trust. Um, and it's particularly trust or distrust of black and brown people and how the, what the expectations are, what, you know, what, what we're going to do with the money. Uh, not necessarily thinking that we, you know, we, we, and I, I really, one of my hopes is that we don't have to continue to do research to show how people are using the money. Like we've researched the topic, you know, to heaven. Um, <laughs> you know, people are using the money for the same way, in the same ways that we're using the money to pay our, you know, our rent, uh, to cover childcare expenses, to pay for food, and perhaps a few luxury things here and there, like we all need. Uh, we all need to go and get a good pedicure every now and then. Um, so we, hopefully we can stop, stop, the, stop the need to, to defend how people are using in the, the money and just recognize that our economy is a bit lop, is, is lopsided. And it's because of a, you know, a, a, I think Mary did a fantastic job of laying out the history of who's been excluded from certain uh, benefits over time. Where, well, the chickens have come home to, to roost. Um, and it's time that we create the opportunity to, 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 to reconcile. Cash transfers should work in parallel with other, um, with other aids. I'm sorry, I had to go on a tangent. You know, we, we, continue, we need to continue to support food banks. We need to continue to support nonprofits who are providing other services and we need to provide um, cash through mechanisms that may not you know, garner the, um, the, the, the public attention because it's a, it's a debit card or it's an ACH transfer. I mean, it's the way that, that cash is moved uh, to people and then they get to use it however they, how I, however they determine, but it's, it should be done in parallel to the other supports and other services that are being offered. Absolutely, good point. And I think that's something we can learn to do more of how to braid these things together, just in the way that we would want a response coming to us to be braided, we can do that. Mary, question for you in terms of poverty impacts and what we know from the research. You know that our colleagues have uh, estimated over a 50% reduction in poverty uh, through the COVID relief programs. 
Is there anything similar here? Do we have evidence on effects that we've been able to estimate in terms of how these kind of um, programs can reduce poverty? We absolutely know that uh, these programs reduce hardship and increase things like food security, et cetera. One of the really lovely findings, and I, and I think it, it, it's pretty solid, is uh, on the educational benefits to children. We know when you look at things like earned income tax credit, um, uh, a, an experiment in the um, North Carolina by the Cherokee uh, tribes, um, that people choose to invest in their children's education, their children's well-being, and the educational outcomes go up. Stockton is recently showing um, some mobility, some, some workforce outcomes that, that the, the folks who participated in their cash pilot tended to work more. Um, those, those effects are not, not huge at this point, but it, there's a lot of promise to it. I'll tell you what, the next frontier I've started to talk to my colleagues about even internally is, you know, how, how would we think about um, the racial income gap vis-a-vis -vis the racial wealth gap? Um, so there's a whole terrain here that still needs to be explored. I, I call this whole territory cash-based social policy because to me, it's there's so many interesting, you know, and as a research, I, you know, everything's an experiment, right? So there's so many interesting experiments we can do about how cash can be used to bridge people to mobility, build wealth. Again, are there varieties of policy solutions like baby bonds? You could even call that a form of cash transfer. That's got some remarkable evidence behind it. Um, but we should all be in this cash-based social policy game uh, because I do think that the equity benefits, the choice benefits, the potential of including people, all of that's in the evidence already. I mean, there's a lot of folks who are saying, you know, I don't have to prove this anymore. I just want to do it to show how it solves my problem as an administrator of benefits in a municipal or state setting, for example. Great. One last question really quickly before we close out here. It's been a fabulous discussion. Are there any instances where cash transfers should not be used as you're thinking? We were talking about how it can be used in parallel with other things. Um, we're saying it's coming out of trust-based philanthropy, and so we're excited to see its development. Just are there any points where we say this is, this is not an instrument or a tool that should be used? I mean, I think um, part of the reason it was so important to have such a large amount for Magnolia Mother's Trust is because of the uh, cliffs, the benefits cliff. And so when we talked, it was like, you know, can we make sure that we're doing no harm? Because you don't want them to then hit that cliff and be way worse off than where you started. say there are any instances where it shouldn't be used, but there are instances where it needs to be in parallel or in conjunction with other types of supports. So I think about, you know, cash is what we, we don't live in a barter economy for the most part. We live in a cash economy. So people need cash to function in, in our society. But one of the, one of the things where we've made some progress as a U.S. society is around healthcare. I don't think we should get rid of our healthcare system and just like have people pay the individual be the, the payers of their health care. I think we have to actually have to keep building that. So I think we do need universal health care for all. We need some things like universal child care and universal paid leave. Now, cash can help supplement all of those things, but I do think there's some baseline systems um, that we ought to have in place. I like that a lot, Nisha, really putting in perspective of where this fits and what kind of solution it is, but it's within a larger structural system where we need other solutions as well. Would love to thank this great panel. We could do this for all day if we needed to, but really appreciate you all taking the time to be in this really fruitful discussion. To our audience, please don't forget to complete the very brief one to two minute survey that will be shared in the chat. Uh, the recording and slides will be posted on the event page for Urban Institute, and we hope to see you again very soon at another event. Thank you all. Really appreciate your time.